love you. Yes. What, what, what an amazing group of people. People who really care about teaching, about being thought leaders, about impacting, about making a difference. Yes, let's hear it for you. I, I love you. I, uh, I was thinking about the journey that led to this moment, and I don't mean the flight and so on, I mean the 20-year journey, uh, almost to the day when I was staring at a piece of paper in my hands, actually not very far from here. I was visiting the United States, and, uh, and I, I'd been brainstorming th this question, what would you do if you could do anything? Right? So I'd brainstorming, what, what would you do with your life? I look at these, these scribbles, all these answers, and uh, what I notice when I'm finished is not what I'd written down on the list, but what I hadn't written down on the list. I noticed law school was not on the list, which was inconvenient because I was at the time at law school. <laughs> And, and here I am in the United States on the other side of the world, and finally I think, well, I know what to do. I think I better call my parents. And so I call the 15-digit number back to England, and my mother answers, fortunately. She listens for a while. She says, I think you better talk to Dad. <laughs> now, he comes on the phone. Now, what would you say, really? What would you say to your son after all this time, all this money, all this effort, he's calling you from halfway around the world, and, 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 and he's, uh, he's thinking of, uh, you know, throwing us away. What, what, what are you going to say? Are Don't be shy. What's that? Are you drunk? I'm a... <laughs> Wait, what's your name? Shannon. Shannon, come up. <laughs> Shannon, Shannon gets to be my dad. That's just what you wanted, wasn't it? What she said was, did you hear? Did anybody hear? Are you drunk? You all heard that, didn't you? That was a, that was a little too enthusiastic there. You're like, he, he could have been. He could have been. Here we go. You get to be my dad, Shannon. So start the way you started. Are you drunk? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not drunk, Dad. I just don't think this is for me. Um... Are you sure? Well, I've given it a lot of thought for about uh, the last 20 minutes. Have you been taking anything that you need to tell me about? <laughs> well, I, I've been taking law school, and I think you did know about that, but, 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 but I want out. Is it okay? No. Oh, why? I think maybe you need a nap. I, I, I just want to quit law school. I, I want to do something else. This isn't for me. There's something else for me. I got nothing. You got nothing? I got nothing. Well, what I'd, really, what I'd really like to do is I would, I, I would like to... Uh, I have a, a vague sense. I'd like to teach and write. You know you won't make any money doing that. <laughs> Thank you. And a round of applause. <laughs> My father became quite Churchillian in this moment. I, I was surprised by this. Son, son, you know what we've always told you. Parenthetically, what do you think that he thinks he always told me? What do you think? Don't be shy. You can be whatever you want to be. Yeah, I love this. You can be whatever you want to be. No, he said go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> But he too seemed to forget that in this moment. No, because all Englishmen quote Shakespeare <laughs> over tea and crumpets for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> he pulls this line straight out of Hamlet's son. He said, to thine own self be true. <laughs> That's what we've always told you. Oh, she says, he would never said that to me in his whole life. <laughs> and never since. But somehow he pulls it out in this moment. Well, law school was out. No more law school. Why does that matter? Because what was on the piece of paper were a series of uh, uh, principles and questions, and out of those grew one question that I've been especially interested in for all these almost 20 years. And I'm going to put that to you in a moment. Before we do that, we have a different question, which is, are there, by a show of hands, any runners in the room? Any runners in the room? Right. I love it when people answer this question. They do this. She's like, I've heard of the concept. Because <laughs> for the rest of us, it's just a completely guilty moment, isn't it? We're like, 
well, I probably should sometimes, right? I mean, <laughs> occasionally. It's like when you go to the doctors and they ask you, how many days do you exercise on average? And you think, I can't put zero to one. <laughs> and the next question is, how many days do you drink each week? And I think most people don't want to put a higher number for the second than the first. Okay, one of the runners here, there was a runner here. Here, we got a runner here. Nobody wants to put their hand up now because they think they might be shamed on stage. No, you're up for it, I can tell, I see. You're like, bring me up. Okay, you're going to stay there, good. So, uh, so, so if you and I were to have a race and you won, um, which you would, and really convincingly, I'm sure, and let's say you won by 50 yards, right? You're 50 yards ahead of me at the end of that race, yes? Make sense? Okay, you're not convinced, you're like, I'm not sure I can see this. It's going to happen. And you, we race a second time. Is this all making sense? You, you get to start the second race a little differently than a normal race, 50 yards ahead of me at the beginning, you see? And you win the second race by an additional 50 yards, right? You are now how far ahead of me at the beginning of the third race? <laughs> Help her out. A hundred. <laughs> Not a math major. <clears throat> so you're a hundred yards ahead of me. Now, you can all answer this question now. Approximate percentage chance, what's your name? Luta? Utah. Utah. That's a good name for being here, isn't it? <laughs> Utah in Utah. Utah is now how many yards, no, what is the per approximate percentage chance that Utah is going to win the third race, starting with a 100-yard advantage. Approximate percentage chance. Oh my goodness, that was like in unison. All of you said 100. That's a little rude. All of you, out. Is it rude? They're all like, we don't know what to say now. It's not rude, is it? It's not rude, it's completely obvious. Of course, of course you will win now to this question that bubbled up from that 20-minute brainstorm all these years ago. Why is it that otherwise successful people and companies don't continue to win? Why don't they break through to the next level of success? Why don't they continue to discover a higher and higher contribution and success? So, I'll give you a moment. Why do you think? Why is it that otherwise successful people and companies don't continue to be successful, because when you look at the data, when you look at the research, as I have done, you find that while it's logical it should happen, in fact, this group over here wasn't sort of sure, they didn't put like a 90 percentile on it, they didn't say, well, there's a possibility, an outlier, they said it's 100 percent, there is no possibility, in fact. But when you look, as they say on the data, that's not what happens, why? But to show a hand, uh, hand up if you have an answer, if you have a thought, go. They stop running. Why would they do that? They're so far ahead. There's complacency. Good. Thank you. More. Go. They forget, they forget their core value. Why would they do that? Okay, similar. So, so it's a complacency thing. More. Here, go. They're, they're hustling you. You mean they stop winning the other person? The other person. I am hustling Utah. I'm faking you, and I'm going to take it right at the end. That's what's happening, by the way. Yes, go. Other obstacles get in the way. Other obstacles get in the way. Like what? Like just so, so, the situation changes. Any number of things. Good. They develop a fixed mindset. They're afraid of the possibility of, of, of the next level of challenge. Yeah, this, Carol Dweck would be proud. Go misdirected leadership, but why would there be... Yes, I suppose that's true, isn't it? If you, if you don't continue to win, there's got to be something misdirected, but why? Why would they do that? Financially or their values? Something gets out of, out of the way. Let me share a thought. I love all these, I love these thoughts. Let me share a thought for your consideration that came to me. It was one of these insights hidden in plain sight. Now, sometimes those are the hardest to see, aren't they? So obvious so embedded in the culture and the question that you don't see it. I was working with Silicon Valley companies and I noticed a predictable pattern, the four-stage pattern. 
Stage one, they were focused on the right things, the right time for the right people. Some of that's luck, but some of it was discernment and figuring it out. So the first stage is focus. What's the first stage? Focus. Led to success. Focus led to success. That is, there was lots of momentum, there's lots of support, lots of people want to, uh, you know, you got, your business is doing well. It's, it's got momentum. So the second stage is success. What's the second stage? Success. What's the first stage? Focus. Leads to? Success. Right, what does success lead to? That's an important question. Because let me put to you this thought, that almost all the literature that's ever been written about success is about how to become successful. And almost none of the research and almost none of the literature is written about what to do once you are. And I find that really interesting. So, what happens with success? Well, there's an increase of options and opportunities. Does that, does that make sense to you? Do you buy that? Is you become more successful, more people want to partner with you, more customers want to work with you, more, more options are coming your way. So, the third phase is options. What's the third phase? Options. What is it? First? Okay. Leads to? Success. Leads to? Options. Now, what does options and opportunities lead to? I mean, that sounds like the right problem to have, doesn't it? But it, it, it does, in fact, turn out to be a problem if it leads to what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined Pursuit of more. The undisciplined pursuit of more. C can, you, can you visualize what the undisciplined pursuit of more looks like? What does it look like when a company or an individual gets consumed in the undisciplined pursuit of more? What does it look like? Chaos, chaos is exactly the right word. So the fourth phase is chaos. What's the fourth phase? Chaos. That is fascinating, isn't it? Focus leads to success, leads to options, leads to chaos. Success leads to chaos? <laughs> what I found is that the answer to the question about why otherwise successful people and companies don't continue to be successful is success. Success. Uh, it turns out that success is a poor teacher. Think of that. Now, maybe that seems like a a bold statement to make. Why should you listen to me on that? It's not me who said it. You know who said that? Success is a poor teacher. Bill Gates. Of all the people who might know, success is a poor teacher. If it leads to the pattern we're just describing. And so I learned this counterintuitive insight, which is that success can become a catalyst for failure. Because it undermines the very things that led to success in the first place. So, in this conversation today, what I'm suggesting is that we need to figure out how to become successful at success. We have to become successful at success. But let's pause for a second on this. Can you think of companies that have gone through the pattern that we've just described? Can you name them? Name any companies. What's that? Apple. Apple, well, that's Enron. interesting. Yes, Apple definitely went through it, right? Enron. Enron. Kodak. Uber. Uber's a fascinating recent example, isn't it? More. Uh, Airbnb. Ooh, that's interesting. Airbnb. Do you, think do you think they're in chaos right now? No. Did you say it? But you don't think they're in chaos? They're getting there. They could be in trouble. Let's riff on this just for a second, because I, I, I know Brian, the, the founder of Airbnb, and I, I talked to him uh, you know, not so very long ago, and he was explaining to me something that was just explained exactly the pattern we just went through. It's like a perfect case study. He said in phase one, he said, he said, at first we were a little bit all over the place, but we finally figured out, you know what they wanted to do, by the way? Now we're riffing all over the place, but you see, you see, you know that originally, I talked to one of the investors that almost invested in Airbnb, and she didn't, and I was like, well, do you regret that now? And she said, well, sort of, but when they came to me, their big idea was to sell politically themed cereal at the Republican and Democratic convention. That is how Airbnb almost was. <laughs> but that didn't seem like a good idea after a while for some reason. And so they stumbled on this idea of having an airbed in their room and renting out the space, which I suppose also didn't seem like a super superb idea, but it just somehow connected and was the right idea. They said that they became incredibly focused at one point. They said, this is it. We can sense it. We can feel there's something here. We have an investor conference coming up in 90 days, 
and we want to demonstrate that we are a profitable company by then. They called their strategy Ramen Profitable. What do you think that means? If we three founders make uh, only eat ramen noodles three times a day for 90 days, we will demonstrate that we're profitable. That is exactly what it meant, and they were. He said it's the most focused as a company they've ever been and the most productive 90 days they've ever had. That helped to lead to success, which has increased their options not tenfold, not a hundredfold, thousandfold. I don't know what the number is, right? But it's a massive number, a huge factor of increase. Have they become successful, by the way? Yes. Is there any question? No, I think all the... the, the he told me his number one concern for the company is their success. It's the number of options they have. His number one concern for the company, he emailed just that to his whole company, as like he does an email for the year. I'm sure he does more than one, but like one at the beginning to everybody. And this was his concern. And he said, connected to that, we have to figure out what the one next big thing is. And they finally determined what the next one thing would be, and it's this idea that in addition to renting houses, you can rent experiences. So that when you're in that area, you don't become a tourist and go to all the normal touristy things. You stay in a house, then you have an experience, you can connect with the local culture and have an experience that only a local culture would, ex would, would be able to present to you. This is this next one idea. So I don't know. It's, 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 he, he doesn't know if they're going to do well enough at this, uh, at, at, at what to do about this. But can you see the pattern and the risk? But, but here's a question for you. We've been talking about companies at the company level, but can it also be true at the individual level? Yes. Could you and I go through the pattern? Focus, success, options, chaos. I wasn't going to share this, but one of the ways that this came to me, in the midst of my professional work observing this phenomenon, trying to label it and name it, and um, I, I also sort of had an experience on the personal level that made me realize this is a, a human phenomenon. It's not a business phenomenon. It's a human phenomenon. It was when um, uh, a colleague of mine sent me an email, said a Friday would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby. If she was expecting otherwise, that's even stranger <laughs> email to receive. But, you know, I need you to be at this client meeting. Friday comes, we're in the hospital because I'd daughter had been born the night before, and we were in the middle of all of that, and yeah, my wife is well, and my daughter is well, as well as, as well as people are as they've gone through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know just what I'm talking about. But to my shame, I, I, I went to the meeting. How do I keep both happy, you see? I, if I keep, keep my wife happy, I also have it, and keep... Colleague happy, client happy, everybody happy. Got to keep everybody happy. Just everybody, do everything for everybody, always. It's a good strategy. <laughs> Brings tremendous consequences. <laughs> Afterwards, I remember my colleague said, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. The look on their faces, incidentally, didn't evince that sort of confidence. <laughs> But even, even if they did, you all know, collectively, I made a fool's bargain. And from it learned the simplest of lessons, which is this, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. It's not neutral. It, 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 well, that's me. Uh, but what about you? Okay, I've got to take like a, a, a snap poll of the group, literal snap poll, right? Have, if, if, if any of the following is true for you, I want you to snap. Have, have you ever found yourself, like I was, stretched too thin at work or at home? Snap for that. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself, like I was, busy but not productive? Snap for that. H have you ever been, like I was, where you feel like somebody else's Agenda is hijacking your day. Now, I got somebody dancing over there to that one. <laughs> Why? Why? People pleasers. I, I love people pleasers because this is like the best backdoor brag in the world. We do it to ourselves all the time. Well, you see, I'm just a people pleaser. 
I just, keep, I just like to keep everybody happy. Does it work? No, what did you say? It's exhausting. Snap at being a people pleaser exhausting for you. Yeah. People pleasers. Maybe we're just afraid of people. Maybe it's not really pleasing. We just don't want to. I don't know. Some things are missed with people pleasing. Why else? Why else do we? Why, why are we snapping? Why? I mean, why would you allocate resources? Let's look at it visually. Why would you allocate resources in such a way that your life starts to feel like the image on your left? FOMO. FOMO. It was like a bold yell, wasn't it? <laughs> Who said that? You did. FOMO, meaning the fear of missing out. Is that a real phenomenon? Yeah. yeah. Well, what we have to discover is the joy of missing out. Or JOMO. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you do it? Why, do you, why is the CEO of your own life, I mean, if you're not the CEO of your own life, I don't know. As the CEO of your own life, why are you choosing to allocate resources in such a way that you're spread too thin at work and at home? Why? Makes you feel important. Makes you feel important. I was talking to somebody recently. They said to me, first time I ever met them, mind you. How are you, I said. People used to say great or good or fine to that, but no, no, not anymore. Busy. She said, I'm so busy, Greg. Busy, so busy. <laughs> I've been so busy, I slept on average four hours a night for the last two weeks. Yes, she's smiling. Why is she smiling? What's that? She, she's crazy. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I mean she, she thinks, I think she was saying, she didn't say, I think she's saying, Greg, I hate to break it to you. I'm just a little more important than you are. You get to sleep a full night, but me, no, no. And there's such high demand, you see. <laughs> and and, and we're, all, we're, we're all in this because, you know, we would never say, would we? We'd never say, this employee over here, that's fantastic. It's fantastic, this employee, they're just drunk all the time. It's marvelous, the way they make the decisions, inebriated like that. <laughs> we love it. We'd never say that. And yet, if you're sleeping four hours a night, it's the same physiologically and psychologically as if you're drunk. This is absolutely true. Uh, I, I, compared to that, now we're just riffing on sleep, I didn't expect it, but we might as well. Highest performers. You remember Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule? He got from uh, Eric Anderson's study. You remember this? And, and, and he showed that the highest correlated item that distinguished the top performers from just the good performers was how many hours they were focused on that thing. That's quite an essentialist idea, but so is the number two most correlated item that distinguishes the top performers from the good performers. It was number hours of sleep. You believe that? They average sleep eight and a half hours in a 24-hour period. I say it that way because they didn't just sleep more at night, they took more naps too. Yes, this, this, this man is in favor. He was like this, he was like, yes, I am validated. <laughs> because the key was not just how many hours you do a thing, but how many uh, intentional and present hours you could have doing that thing. Now we're just riffing on that, but it's a good illustration of the broader point, which is that we've been conned. <laughs> That's the bigger idea. We, let's give the con a name, it's called non-essentialism. Non-essentialism simply says this idea, look, what you have to do, have to seems to be the word of choice, what you have to do is everything for everyone always. We mentioned it before. That's the key to break through success. Everything for everyone, always. And, and, and if that's working for you, by the way, just double down on it. Really. If that's working for you, do more, just sleep less. Don't sleep at all. Just say yes to every idea you have and everything everybody around you is doing and everything you see people doing on Facebook, you just <clears throat> pick up that idea, put it back in, in your backpack and stomp around with it. If it's working, go for it. I, I say that, of course, only half seriously, but if it's working, fine. Ignore everything I'm saying. But if it might not be working, th th there might be a way out, an alternative, because if the problem is this undisciplined pursuit of more that creates this sense of chaos, 
then to get back to a sense of clarity, we have to discover the disciplined pursuit of less, especially the disciplined pursuit of less but better. The disciplined pursuit of less but better. Or said differently, discover how to become an essentialist. That's essential. Essential means the very most important things. Essential things. So to become an essentialist means to not sort of listen to a presentation like this and go, yeah, that's, that's great, Greg, as people sometimes say. That's great, Greg. That's just one more thing I really need to, you know, one more thing I need to do. And I think I must not have said that clearly. It's not one more thing. It's, it's the work of life to do these things, to explore what is essential, to eliminate the non-essentials, and to create systems, routines, patterns, to make execution as effortless and frictionless as possible. Those are the, the, at the conceptual level. Ex explore what is essential, eliminate what is not, and use those resources to build systems that enthrone and protect and help you to really actually get the right things done. And no, it's not about, this isn't, essentialism is not about getting more, more stuff done. It's about getting the right things done at the right time for the right people. Uh, everything for everyone always or the right things for the right people at the right time. There is an alternative path. And in our busyness bubble that I think we're in today, you can still choose to be an essentialist before the bubble bursts. You can do something about it. What can you do? Let me give you some specific things, and maybe they'll sound vanilla to you. <laughs> but it's all about knowing how to do them right, and it's all about doing them consistently. The cumulative power of these things is simply immense. The first thing, the first thing, is to hold a personal quarterly offsite. Every 90 days, you take a day to reflect on the big picture. What really matters most to me and why? Who matters most to me and why? And because of those things and the things that are going in my life, what are the, just the top, maybe one goal personally and one goal professionally over the next 90 days? You might have other goals, but if you don't have clarity about that, then you're going to become a function of all the different things that come your way. Then, you don't stop there just a quarterly offsite. Then you do this simple thing also, more vanilla than the first. One to two hours of weekly planning around what you have identified as essential. So your reflection is taking place, your deep reflection, on the 90-day personal quarterly offsite. But then, weekly, you do it. And you protect that with all you have. Because seriously, it's the smallest practice, but this is the practice that makes the difference. If, you, if you're doing that occasionally, if you're doing it never, I mean, if you're really being honest, there's people here never doing it. Really, we're not really... Somebody said to me on the phone yesterday, I asked them about this, I said, um, executive, and I said, how often are you doing this? And we talked about the daily planning, the weekly planning and so on. He said, well, you know, what I normally do is I sort of, I'll make a list of the things that must get done. And, and I thought, yeah, that's not really weekly planning. It's the beginning, like the piece of it. And, and, and here he is, executive of this large organization. The cost of him not really planning every week is immense on that organization. It's immense in his own life because you're making trade-offs all the time. Every week we're making trade-offs, of course, because the number of things we can do, the number of good things we can do so massively outweighs the available resources that we have. So, of course, we're making trade-offs. That's just life. The question is whether we're making them ourselves deliberately through a planning process or whether we're just reacting to the latest email. So, this leads us to the second of the principles to eliminate the non-essentials. The, 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 to understand this, I think what we have to do is look at your closet for a moment. <laughs> For some people here, they're like, oh no, I hope he doesn't have a picture of that. <laughs> have you ever, has your closet ever got overly full? Has it ever fallen into the undisciplined pursuit of more? 
<laughs> the chaos we just described. Have you, ever, have you ever had a sort of essentialist moment where you're like, I am going to do the noble thing, clear out that closet. I deserve it. And you go in there as if to take an item off the shelf, as if to give it away. Your intentions are good. But then in a moment, as you take it off the shelf and you're looking at it, you think, well, it could come back into fashion again sometime. I could fit it again sometime. I might possibly wear this again in the future, perhaps. And the answer to that question is what? Could, it, could you ever possibly use it again? So that becomes a yes. It goes back on the shelf, because the question we're using is so broad. The criteria is so massive. What would be a more, a more narrowing, selective criteria we could use in our closet? Have I worn it this year? Have I worn it this year? You know, some people, the, the number of items they haven't worn this year is far greater than the number that they have. Yeah, there's some guilt nodding here. Yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> What's another create, uh, selective question we could use? Do you, love it? do you love it? And somebody had to do that. They said, does it bring you joy? Which is uh, the Marie Kondo question and a superb essentialist question. Now, we're talking about closets now, but make the connection with me back to your life and to your schedule. What's, what's the connection there? We're not talking about the closet, we're talking about the closet of your life. So how do you apply this principle of selective questions to your life? What would selective questions look like for you? What questions could you use? Does it energize, Does it energize me? Rather than, did somebody email me about it? Good, more. What questions can you ask? Does it serve? Does it serve now? Give somebody up me on that. Up, up the, plus it to a more selective question. Not just does it serve somebody. What, what would it? Does it serve me? Okay. Plus it more. Does it serve? Does it serve my family? Does it serve my goals? Does it? Does it serve my values? And all of these, I will point out to you, are plural terms. If I was listening correctly, and I, and I would push you just to be singular. Is this the best possible use of me? Is this the best possible use of me? Is this going to support my highest point of contribution? Is this the priority right now? The word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. What did the word priority mean in the 1400s? Don't let it stump you, it means the same now. What does the word priority mean? The most, the most important thing. How, how many are there? One. Because it's the very priorist thing. It is the most prior thing, the first thing, right? We're all together on this. According to Peter Drucker, the word priority stayed singular for 500 years. 500 years. I mean, that's like half a millennium that people weren't using the term priorities. And why weren't they? Because it's just one. So I struggle even now to know what the word priorities actually means. I mean, can you have very, very many, very first, before all other things, things? Can you? It's a form of madness, I think, that's taken hold, yes. So, 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 so the word priority, and yet haven't you been to a meeting where somebody said with no sense of irony at all, here are my 20 priorities? And they all have to be done, when? Yesterday. <laughs> not, not even now, yesterday. I never heard anything so ridiculous, really. So figuring out what is, you know, what you're going to say yes to, what you're going to say no to. Fewer things, less but better, that you say yes to. The, we, we, we can say it here, if it's not a clear yes, then it becomes a clear no. You don't get muddled in the middle, that's the challenge. For a group like this, of successful, capable, curious, driven people, that's what you have to be to even be in the room today. The, the challenge is that you will have far too many good things to do. Far too many. Like a factor of ten too many. 
So your job is to not do something that's a one out of 10, yes, or a two out of 10. Okay, that's sort of obvious. But what about the five, six, sevens, eights out of 10, yes? That's like, well, they're really pretty good. It's a pretty good thing. They do some pretty good thing for someone. And what I would challenge you to do is to look for the nines and tens and at least consider eliminating everything below that. At least consider it. Pause. You don't have to say no to everything else, but I don't think you'll regret it. Uh, eliminate the non-essentials. And then, of course, with execution, what we, we really mean with execution, there's a lot of ways to execute in the way we're describing, but, but what I think is, is to do... I think this, be present right now to what's important right now. Be fully present here and now. That's, that's sort of the test, that's, uh, that's essentialism at the cutting edge of execution. What's important now? And I am all there now. Can you tell when somebody is not all there for you? Can you tell even if the eyes are there that the heart isn't? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you done it yourself? Are you sometimes really distracted because you're on your phone? It's easier to face your phone than face your life. <laughs> yeah. Be focused and fully present here, right now. And if you find that the here, right now, you go, I shouldn't even be here right now, then you know you can start adjusting. That's part of the story but be here, fully present now. I want to tie everything we've talked about together with a single story. I almost, I almost became a barrister, a lawyer in England, as I told you. But this is a story about somebody who did become a barrister, and he might have just stayed a barrister in England, but a family emergency brought him to South Africa. And so he takes the the trains and so on, and, and he's in South Africa, and he's in first class going from point A to point B, and, and he's not allowed to be there. I don't think he knew that, but he's physically thrown off the train. That became a defining moment, an essential thing for him. This is just wrong, and I, I, I must make the trade-offs in order to pursue this. And he does, and it takes him a long time, as almost all tasks do, <laughs> much longer than we think they will take. It took him 23 years to take on that law, and he won. He won. So that was focus that led to? So now people have been following him, watching him, noticing him, and he goes back to India, the home of his birth, and people are at the train station, and they're saying, we need you to run for office. They want something from you. They've seen the success. They, and of course, I think the ego in many people would find that quite, quite uh, I don't know, satisfying in the moment. They want me to run for office. Well, maybe I should run for office. Maybe I'm the answer to the problem. But he had enough discernment to not get into this paradox of success that we've described. He didn't get into chaos. He said no. He said that this isn't it. And one of the, one of the reasons it was not a, a yes for him was because he didn't know why it was that so few British could control so many Indians so effortlessly in that country. And so part of... His solution was to explore what was essential, what, what really is going on. And so he went out listening, being present in the paddy fields with the poorest of the poor, trying to put together, I suppose, a 3D image of what, what's really going on here. How does it all work? He spent one year doing that, listening, connecting the dots, figuring it out. And an insight that finally came to him through this process was salt. Infinitesimally small, infinitely important. Salt. The British controlled the production of salt and therefore bread and the entire food chain. And if you can control the entire food chain, then you can keep a people under your control quite easily. And so it grew out of that, the idea, a key and catalytic moment in the civil rights movement in India was for him to walk across India in a demonstration of civil disobedience. It became known as the Salt Marches. And he went to the beach, made salt, symbolically. Now, if you, if you decide to go somewhere and nobody's following you, then you're not being a leader, right? You're just 
going for a walk. <laughs> it became a march because some 600,000 people followed him. And the British stood back, who is this little man? And where does his power come from? Where does his power come from? He has no political power. He has no title whatsoever. He has no money. Where does his power come from? As they're busy figuring that out, his grandson is still in South Africa. He got beaten up uh, for being too black, and, and later by a different group of people for being too white. He's so angry. And Gandhi has the presence, that's the right word, isn't it? The presence to say, come and live with me for a while. I interviewed Aaron Gandhi, his grandson, about that experience. Aaron told me, here's what he did. He listened to me for one hour a day for a year and a half. Think of the pressures that were on him. Think of the different things he could have been doing. Think of the non-essentials. Think of the six, sevens, and eights out of ten that he had to say no to, to focus on that. But here, I suppose now, 50 years or more since that happened, the influence has continued. And his, his, his grandson's influence will go on for, I suppose, another 100 years through his children and so on. Massive impact. But what happened even in his pursuits within India? We know didn't, he brings independence to the largest democracy in the world. At the time, 300 million people, and uh, uh, now more than a billion. When he died, it was General Marshall of the Marshall Plan. That's what he's most famous for. You remember the Marshall Plan after the Second World War? This was what rebuilt Germany, rebuilt, helped us avoid a third world war. This is a man, Marshall knew about empires and what it takes to build states and rebuild them. This is a man who knows. It was him who said, I'm going to leave the word blank. He said of Gandhi, here is a man who has shown that X is more powerful than empires. What is more powerful than empires? What? Where does he have the power? His word was simplicity. Simplicity is more powerful than empires. And Einstein said of Gandhi, generations to come will scarce believe that such a one as this, ever in flesh and blood, walked upon this earth. Now, the point of the story is not for us to become Gandhi. <laughs> That's not our mission. But it is to be filled with the clarity around our essential purpose and mission in life, and then, of course, each quarter, and then this week so that we are getting the right things done. Life for you is fast and full of opportunity. As, as thought leaders, as trainers, as facilitators, as, of course, more than that, as, as spouses, as parents, your life is fast and it's full of opportunity today. And the complication is that we've been taught to believe in a con, that we have to do everyone, do everything for everyone, always. And the impact of that is that we plateau in our progress. Do not fulfill the unique purpose that we were built to fulfill. When I was in South Africa recently speaking at a conference just like this, I went to where Gandhi was, where he lived for those 23 years, and I was given a poem that I was told was the only poem he ever wrote. And in that, found four words succinctly summarizing the highest manifestation of what it means to be an essentialist. Here are the words, reducing oneself to zero. That is, to keep eliminating who we aren't so that we can become who we really are. Look, it's been years and years since that moment in the hospital for me. Uh, I have one of my daughters with me just today. We've made different trade-offs since then. Hundreds and hundreds of different trade-offs. I don't regret any of those. You never regret, you never regret making an essential trade-off for a less essential trade-off, no matter what the consequence. And I think many, many years from now, on our deathbeds, let's say, or maybe beyond, we look back at today 
We might regret lots of things, but choosing to become an essentialist, I do not think will be one of those regrets. And I wonder, I wonder on that day, what you will hope that you did on this one. That matters. Thank you very much.